John, thank you for coming on, mate. Uh, I've actually had this one probably on my radar a little bit longer than you've had it on your radar. Um, I managed to track you down from traveling around the world, and it's good to finally have a chat. Um, as your last, we, even though we just kind of spoke about it, has the last, core blimey, the, I guess the last 12 months been for you in the in the whole England setup? Oh, well, so my 12 months ago, my job, I came just probably 12 months ago now, i just come back from under 19 World Cup. Um, we got knocked out in the, in the sort of in the round robin stage by Australia and the West Indies. So we had a, in terms of results, at a, a poor tournament. Um, we finished, I think, finished 10th overall, but we managed to almost, I suppose, what they call win the runners up, mm. the plate type thing, which, which is a nice thing to win because it gives the lads a nice sense of um, achievement when, they, when they're coming home, but also it's a really not a great thing to win because you've obviously got knocked out in the rounds, mm. in the early rounds of the tournament. So um, there was, during that period, a, a, a lot of learning for, for me as a coach and a lot of learning for... Um, for the for the players, and obviously we came back, and from there in March April time is COVID time. Yeah. <laughs> so you know COVID comes in, and, and I was I was put on furlough for a, for a, for a bit. Um, um. So I spent a lot of time here at home, and then I I sort of I was looking at what I was doing as a under nineteen coach, and I looked at looked ahead, and I thought, well, it's going to be really unlikely that there's any under nineteen cricket going on. Um, in the in the near future, at a national or international level. So I, I said to my direct my direct line my boss, um, my Boba, I said to him, look, if there's any opportunities in and around the England team to help get these get this um, show back on the road, then I'm really keen to, to get in and get involved. Um, unfortunately, at the time, um, the staff in at the staff at ECB, the, the staff coaches at ECB, there wasn't many of them. Mm. Um, and so they were, Chris Silverwood was really the only bowling coach um, in and around the England team. So they decided in their wisdom to, to use me to help get all the, the players back up and running from a, a standing start, so to speak, back last sort of um, May time to get them ready to play some county cricket and then obviously into into bubble life in the, the in last year against... Um, Geez, it was at West Indies. So I think that started in sort of June, July time, and then against uh, I was involved. I was involved in getting those guys up and running, and then and then I was involved in getting the white ball specialist up and running, and I was involved then in directly with the white ball team over the summer, and that led obviously led on to some work with the winter with the white ball side in South Africa, and then followed on with the test test um, test team in in Sri Lanka and India. Um, and you know, so it was a very different year to what I had planned. I had planned a yeah. year around working out how to start afresh with a new group of under nineteen players, and it turned out to be working with some of the best players in the world in in a, such a different situation that we anyone would have env envisaged. So it's been a really sort of roller coaster year, and it's ended up with me changing jobs and getting a job as um, I think they, I think the, my my proper title is elite fast bowling coach. Yeah, uh, with DB, which is you know. I'm not sure what it actually means, but I'll, you know, I'll, I'll stick it's, it on the seat. It's and, good enough. I'll, I'll go around. Yeah. I was just thinking, how long have you been coaching? How many years is it actually that you've um, officially been coaching? Coaching professionally, as yeah, a professional, yeah, yeah. professional cricket. I've done, I think I've done five, might be six years now. Six yeah, years. Wow. I forget how old I am. Um, <laughs> yeah, I think I finished playing when I was 38, 39. Yeah, and I'm now 45, so coming up to 46. So yeah, six, seven years. But I've always coached, so I've always had a really real um, uh, in a love of coaching, a love of helping um, players. I was brought up a, a, in, in a Gloucestershire team where it was all about helping your mates. And when I was a really young professional, I went and played overseas. And every time I went overseas, I coached at schools, at clubs, uh, primarily to for for, for to get an income. Over the, over the course of the, the winters that I was away, I, was, I played in New Zealand, Australia, and South Africa for five or six years on the trot. And every time I went, I coached, um, basically to find, help finance the trip. But I always really enjoyed that, so coaching young people and, and trying to give a bit back. And then came back to obviously that Gloucestershire team who was successful, and we talked a lot about helping our, our mates and, and coaching each other because there wasn't professional coaching was not as widespread as it is now, and there wasn't as much support. So you used to 
support each other and coach each other. So mm. and it basically I held on to that. And when I was towards the end of my playing career, I was always coaching. Um, I was always coaching on multiple jobs in winters and stuff like that. And I would, most winters I would coach if I wasn't playing or that's even around a, my playing. That's actually like, that's really interesting that you said that about coaching each other. I think that's super valuable there's a um funny enough carl hopkinson i reckon taught me that at a young age obviously carl's the fielding coach for for the england team and i think one of the things he said to me even when when he was a player i can't i don't think he was a coach at the time but he said you have to be able to so if you're like throwing to a teammate you have to be good at that you have to like be able to throw whether it's spin or something that your ability to to give good practice to your teammates to be able to to actually help them out is going to make the team better. You shouldn't just all lie on the coaches all the time. Um, that, that's a really interesting thing that you said there. Was that a culture thing that you put in? Uh, nothing. Not, I don't think it was intentional. Yeah, it was just. Well, it might well have been intentional. John Bracewell, who was our coach at the time, was quite a pretty smart coach, and I think it just comes from the lack of resource. Yeah. And the guys, the guys, all the players wanting to improve, and the lack lack of coaching resource in terms of people's arms, and um, they didn't have one of those dog sticks that everyone uses yeah. now. We didn't used to have those. Hatch. Everyone used to have to throw, um, so or bowl to each other, or play against each other in the nets, or just even talk to each other. And that's the thing I've noticed recently, actually, with the England team, is how much um, they talk to each other, and how much how much the quality of cricket conversation that they have between each other about how to tackle situations their first port of call isn't the coach mm. the first port of call is their teammate to say oh how did you do that against that guy you were successful against that person what was your thinking there and the coach in that scenario is used as an information gatherer and a, a sounding board i mean so my role with the bowling group would be to listen to those conversations either at practice or in and around games gather all that information and make sure i shared it with the whole group yeah. Okay. You know I mean, and then also, also make sure that they those convers that conversation those conversations are backed up with good information, and um, that those conversations are um, are relevant and valid. You know what I mean, I think, and that's the, the thing that I've seen the difference between um, young cricketers now, really young cricketers, uh, young lions, and then young cricketers in county cricket, is a lot of them become, have become quite reliant on their coaches. Um, for time and effort and it's it's almost if the coach doesn't have any time for me it's almost like i can't go and play the game which for me is completely wrong yeah. actually the game, you, you need to be able to understand how to develop yourself and because you're the, the custodian of your game and then you, then your employer is the person who who employs you to play that game and, and can help you and guide you but you're the one that's got to go out on the field and make the decisions and do the, do what's required at the right time and your coach can't be out there with you. Mm -hmm. um, so it's it's important that guys are understand that. And I think the, the modern way is, for, um, and I think it's uh, some real qualities in this is for coaches to be really, really supportive and really, really um, available. Whereas I don't always think that does the player the, the biggest amount of favours because they don't work out the challenges and, and the and the questions that they have for themselves. So I think that, that can, when you get in the middle, you've got to answer the question yourself. So where do you think those, where do you think all that has come from, from the England team? Is that just something that they've just started doing? Is there, because I reckon a part of me thinks of the reason why some people wouldn't say it, wouldn't talk, uh, have those discussions with each other is because they don't want to be seen as if they don't know an answer. They don't want to be seen as if they don't have the answer. It's quite a vulnerable thing to to be able to say like I'm struggling with this this part of my game. How how do you do it? Um, where do you think that's come from in in the England team? Well, there's there's two parts to that. There's there's the bit like you've said you've explained there is like I don't want to show, I don't want to express vulnerability. But there also there's the other bit where the person who's sharing the information wants to keep the information to themselves. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? I, I don't want to share the information because I know what I'm doing. I want to hold on to my place. You know what I mean? So to get in an environment where that, that works really well is that everyone has to be really comfortable in the environment. So they have, there has to be real um, trust in, the, in, their, in their captain. I think a lot of it comes from the captain and, and the head coach, the guys who are leading the groups, is, is like, okay, we're encouraging these conversations to happen 
and, and you're going to have to trust us to um, not view you as, a, as, as someone who can't do something. Or that when someone asks for help, it's because they want to improve. And so if, you're, if you've got players who are continually wanting to improve and have this, I suppose people would call it a growth mindset and hmm. all of those the, the things that you hear about, these guys are talking about all the time. How do I, how do I meet that challenge? How do I get self, make myself better to, to improve so I can, I can beat that opponent? Up, up um, that has to be come from the, from the guys who are leading. So if you've got good leadership, strong leadership, leadership that um, the people, the players in the environment trust, I um, mean, Owen Morgan and Joe Rubin, Chris Silverwood, you got people there that those, those guys trust. And that comes over time. You know, mm. I mean, it only really does come over time and, and those relationships build. And people can see that someone's expressed a vulnerability and they haven't literally got shoved out of the team. You know what I mean? Yeah. So, like, yeah. so you, you have to encourage those things. And then once you've encouraged those things to happen, you can't then push it back on the person who's, who's done it. You know, so that, that comes, those, those relationships take time. And those trusting relationships take time. But I think what new players see when they come into the environment is they see the senior players role modeling those behaviors. And and then they think, okay, well, it's okay to be vulnerable because that, that player there, uh, Jimmy Anderson or Stuart Broad, has been vulnerable and said, look, um, so the day before the first test against Sri Lanka, Stuart Broad spoke actually on the morning of the first test, spoke in a small bowling group um, prior to the game, he smoked about his nerves and um, how he hadn't played for a long time and he was worried about going into the game because he felt a little bit undercooked. I mean, and he openly expressed those things to the other bowlers that were playing that game. And so that has so, so when someone who's done what he's done so often and has been such a good professional and, and, and been so successful is able to express those vulnerabilities to his teammates, all of a sudden the, everyone has, yeah. a, everyone has a breath. Everyone just takes a breath and they go, oh, okay, he's feeling like that. It's okay for me to feel like that. And once you acknowledge those feelings and you acknowledge those feelings are okay, then all of a sudden you start to relax. And when obviously everyone knows when you you play your best, when you're, you're most relaxed and you're, you're at least why. Yeah, at least wow. yeah that's, that's such a nice place for a new player to come in because you don't want to feel like the big the big guys in the team. I mean, Stuart Broad is one of the best bowlers ever in in England setup. So, mm. like, that's that's so nice for for a, a new guy to come in and be able to go. I'm not. This guy's not superhuman. He's not anything. That, that he's not feeling anything that I'm potentially not feeling. Um, and he's like, yeah, like you said, allows that breath. That's what a lovely place to be in. What would you say if if you've got a team and and none of these conversations are going on? And I actually think, I even think to some of the, the the juniors that I've coached this year over the last 18 months that you're like, have these conversations. Like, yeah, stop relying on on me. Um, I think, where have you got any advice for if those are not happening? Yeah, I think what you need to do is you need to start fostering those conversations so, and making players feel uncomfortable. Uh, sorry, feel comfortable to be able to talk. And one of the ways I, I try to do that with uh, our best under 19 players is to let them know it's okay to get things wrong. Mm. So so it's actually, we're here and we're learning. We're trying to become better cricketers. We're not the finished article. This is a small part of your journey to get to where you want to get to. And we're always just looking to improve. And you can only really improve. You can improve when you get things right, but you can improve when you get, you improve probably more when you get things wrong. Mm. So if you see see someone getting things wrong as complete failure and you're not willing to talk about it, um, then you're less likely to, to learn and less likely to improve. So if you keep sending those messages, but also, like I said, backing them up with examples of when someone gets things wrong and then talks about it and sharing with the group saying, look, um, Johnny, Johnny got this wrong the other day. He came to me, talked about it. He went away and practiced and he got out and got it right the next time. Everyone's like, oh, okay, it's okay to do that. Hmm. So it's, it's all right. And all the other players go, oh, okay, okay, it's okay for me to get things wrong. I'm, I'm, I'm not a complete abject failure. The coach doesn't think I'm useless. The rest of my teammates don't think I'm useless because that's probably with young players in particular where they look to the most is hmm. their teammates and, the, and their peer peer recognition is so important to those to the young to young players. Um, it's you know it's it's a fascinating subject and and each and every especially we're talking about coaching teenagers 
and all the stuff that's going on with teenagers and how their, their brains are developing, etc. Yeah. You know what I mean? Um, what they call it, the prefrontal cortex doesn't finish developing until yeah. 23, some people even later. So their ability to make good decisions under pressure is, is really limited um, or, or restricted. And, and they don't always, they can fluctuate in their moods from day to day. So it's very, very hard as a, as a coach to judge those guys. And patience with, with, with people of that age, girls and boys, is such an important thing when you're coaching. Is that you, things are going to take time and kids aren't always going to get things right. Um, and, and as a coach, bloody hell, it's hard because everyone wants to win. Yeah, I mean, you, and you're playing sport to win. You're not playing. Uh, some some people play sport to take part, but most people play competitive sport to win. You know, what I mean, they want to go out and they want to win. And and the hardest thing is to be at peace with losing, as long as the guys are are, are improving. Yeah, yeah. So that's the sort of stuff. When I went to the World Cup uh, with them in the 19s, yes, we lost. But what I see as success is guys transitioning from an under 19 cricket into first class cricket and being successful because they've learned from the mistakes they've made at that level. But you've got to be really a really patient coach to be able to do that because it tests you because you're you're in the spotlight, you've got a high profile role, um, everything's on TV and you've got to answer questions, why why do you win, why do you lose? And you know, you've got to you've got to be really patient with your players. I think you've got to be a patient player as well to do that. It's not just on the coach that needs that patience. The player has to have that patience and also probably the families have to have that patience. I think if you're thinking from a real young, uh, I, I think literally this is just ringing in what I've experienced in the last 18 months. So what I set out and said from the start was, okay, I've got this group of guys and I want to get them better. I want them in three years time to be able to jump into men's cricket and men's sport, whatever, whether it's cricket, Aussie rules, football over here. I want them to go in there with some sort of attributes that allow them to get better at whatever skill set they're putting their mind to. So like I said, it can be anything. It could be business if they wanted it to be. But at the same, but they had to understand that there was this, and I described it as like this seesaw of development and performance. And you very rarely got them balanced together. So if you were with development, then performance fell away. And then once you've developed and you feel confident in that skill, then you might be able to, you can put those performance, you can really focus on that performance. And it was really, really tough to convince people past, I'd say, three months that this is still a process that you have to hang into because yeah. it doesn't have a... There's And also you're talking about each individual person learning in their own individual time frame. Some kids might pick it up in two weeks. Some kids might take two years to pick it up. And that is so hard to figure out how to convince people that development is especially at this young age is where you want to be and i'm talking kids from the ages of like 12 to 17 eight maybe 18 and these guys they, they're learning that you're not going to be the finished product it's so hard to convince them yeah i suppose i'm listening to you there so, so people often separate development and performance there's two different things mm. because actually i tend to tend to view them as they, they work they're, they're, they're together and they're always together because you can't you can't get away from it um, you can't get away from the fact that everyone wants to win. Um, and you're trying to teach people to get better at winning. Mm. Do you know what I mean? So it's like, so so you are develop, developing them as winners. You know what I mean? It's like, but you're right. Different people develop at different, different levels and different paces. But reality is that you should be trying to get them to win and develop at the same time. Uh, you know, and the, the guys who are the best guys do do that um it's but so for some guys it's very hard to to put them both together um and I, I see a lot of coaches trying to separate them or it, i would love coaches to look at it like let's bring these let's bring it together hmm. and see if we can blend it together and use it and, and work work all the time all the time working together as one thing development performance development performance all the time working together because that's the reality with what's actually happening yeah and to, even to say to a young kid Oh, you're just going to develop this thing. Or for the next two months, you're just going to develop. They go, well, I still, I still want to win. Yeah, and you're like, that's... no, no, develop. And, I, and they're like, no, no, I want, I want to win, mate. Like, I mean, <laughs> yeah. You know what I mean, so it's, it's um, so you've got to try and get it all going together. I know what you're saying, and I know I've heard lots of people talk about it in two different separate bits. It's that just somehow try and think about it. How do you, how do you encourage this person to keep understanding how to win whilst developing their game at the same time? 
yeah. I, mean, that's, um, I mean, I talk, I talk to young players about it a lot. I think something like cricket as well allows you to have a little bit of separation if you if you're trying to learn a skill in another asset. So yeah. if you're a bowler, you can develop something in your batting, and and you can have sort of okay, well, I'm performing pretty well with the ball, so the, the bat I can actually. I can actually develop something going on there or yeah. vice versa, whatever it is. I think that's a blessing for something like the sport we play. What were what so, were you what were you like as a as a young kid when you started out? Where what was you <laughs> I never really have spoken to you about this. What were you uh what were you like? Were you um, would you say coachable? Were you were you eager? Were you how did you get into the game? Um I sort of fell into it, to be honest. Um in, in terms of professional game. Um I as a as a young cricketer, like, and we're talking now from probably the age of thirteen, I played men's cricket. Um, obviously, played junior cricket alongside that, like my local club in Swindon. Um, and but from sort of twelve, thirteen, I was playing men's cricket, and I moved up through men's the ranks of men's cricket pretty quickly um, as a batsman rather than a bowler, because um, obviously you feel I was quite. Um, what were they? The, the talent ID guys would call me a quadrant four. So my quadrant, my birthday is uh, 26th of August. So I'm a quadrant oh, four player. Wow. So I'm right at the end of the school year. And I was always quite, I'm quite small. I'm a reasonably big guy now, six foot two. Reasonably well put together, but a lot of that's come from training. Um, and but as a young kid, I was skinny, small. Um, so my bowling, although I opened the bowling at county age group level. Um, playing, but most of my cricket I played was men's cricket, so my bowling was pretty um, innocuous at that that level as a 12, 13, 14 year old player because as, as my batting was going really well and I, I was playing quite a high level of, of men's cricket as, at that age as a batsman. So I didn't generally bowl, I just bowled in junior cricket. Um, um, I suppose, and then I got, I got um, scouted by uh, a local scout to who scouted for Northamptonshire and I went along to a couple of net trials and they offered me a contract um, I don't really know why I must have bowled right in the nets um, um, and they offered me a contract I didn't really know much about it and I was a very amateur you know I mean I've been brought up in a, a club level um, very social um, um, and I was very amateur when I went up to Northamptonshire and I had a couple of injuries and I, I was I had one season there and I was released from, from my contract um, which I was, I'd had a little taste and I was, I was really gutted about. I was like properly um, disappointed. I thought, well, I don't really know what to do now. I um, didn't really have any school qualifications behind me um, in terms of education. I was always a, I was always okay at education. I just didn't enjoy it. Um, I, I imagine my teachers would say that, uh, well, my teachers described me as bright but lazy. I imagine, or, or couldn't couldn't be bothered, which I think applies to quite a lot of young boys. Um, classroom learning just didn't, didn't suit me. Um, academic re- reading, I'm still not a great reader now. Um, I'm an audio book man, you know. What I mean, I can't, mm. I really can't sit down and read. I don't have the attention for it. And they probably diagnose me with something now these days, but, <laughs> but I, I don't, I don't know what that would be. Attention deficit or or dyslexia or something. I don't know. But like there'd be some sort of uh, box that someone would want to put me in, I imagine. Um, but I just would prefer being outside, and still do, outside playing and being around sport. Um, I digressed a little bit here. No. Um, I don't know where am I going. I'm going. And then um, I actually wrote, I how long ago it is, actually I wrote a letter to Gloucestershire to ask for a trial. And so um, wow. between the point of getting released by um, Gloucestershire and at the time I wrote a letter, I went off and played cricket in New Zealand. There was a, a, a Kiwi fellow um, who was staying in the same gigs as me in Northampton. And I was 18 at the time. And I, I got on a plane to New Zealand and I stayed with him and his family. And they put me up. They were really kind to me. Put me up and I, they, they found me a job or multiple jobs within the local community in Christchurch. And I paid my own way. And I played a season of club cricket in New Zealand. And I learned a hell of a lot about mm. how to be more adult. Yeah. I grew up a you know, not a lot, but I grew up a bit. Um, I had to work, I had to earn money. Um, I realised that I didn't really have any qualifications and the only thing I was really any good at was playing cricket. Um, so next time I got an opportunity, I was going to make sure I took it a bit more seriously and um, make sure I, I asked questions, I learned. And so when I got an opportunity to go and play for Gloucestershire, 
um, some one of the coaches there phoned me up and I got on the train up to Worcester, I think, to play a second team game from Swindon. Um, I walked to the walked to the station with my bag really early in the morning. Got the train, walked from the train station to the to the um, to the ground. I had no cash, you know what I mean. So I was um, I I then played that game and I, and they just kept asking me back to play some more. And by the mm-hmm. by the time I got to the end of that season, I was playing first team. Um, and then I did I very rarely play second team after that. I probably played more second team with you hatch than I had done. Yeah, um, when I was still, <laughs> yeah, I done at Sussex and I had done um, towards the end of my career uh, than I had done really in the last sort of 20 years in between. Um, because I made a when I started playing first time, I made a decision again is like I'm going to make sure that I'm playing first time and I'm make sure that I'm, and I'm going to make sure I keep learning, make sure I keep asking good questions. I'm going to look around me, I had some brilliant role models in the dressing room, Jack Russell. Uh, Mark Elaine, um, Mike Smith was a really good mentor for me. And Courtney Walsh, who used to, used to I used to travel with, and I used to listen to those guys about how they how they played their cricket. And I used to watch them go about their business, and how they practiced. And I go right, okay, those guys have had 10, 12, 15, 20 years playing professional cricket. This is how they go about it. And that's what I'm going to do, and I'm just going to mm. I'm just going to watch their behaviours. I'm going to I'm going to crack I'm going to crack on and I'm going to get better, and so. That was sort of how I got into it. And, uh, and like I say, I sort of fell into it. There was no academies. There was no, yes, I was a good young cricketer, but it wasn't really a, there wasn't really a pathway that everyone has now. Mm. Uh, everything's taken care of now, really, at a young age. But players very rarely get missed, apart from if guys are, are really late developers. Yeah. It's physically, especially fast bowlers, no, yeah. physical, physical late developers. I think you can, you can miss those guys who see bowlers come from nowhere at 21 22 and they've, mm. they've just grown into themselves and become a lot a lot more proficient at what they can they're able to physically do what they're, they're being asked to do but they shouldn't really get missed now because all the counties all the professional counties have links with all the minor counties and it all the best players really they get picked up um pretty quickly and so yeah that's all that's what i say i sort of fell into it and that's sort of the start of my journey really it was a it was it was a bit lucky really when you look back on it what do you think when you were first going to that changing room? Because I imagine it's a, first off that changing room is a lot different from what first team changing rooms look like now. Um, what do you think the biggest thing you felt you were going to have to learn was when you started off? I think in professional professional sport in particular is brutal. You know, mm. what I mean, like you, you get some old pros, especially at a county level, who are. I think you do a little bit less now, but. But certainly when I was starting, I'm very protective of their position and their job. You've got to remember mm. it's their job. Yeah. You know, so you're going to someone you're going into someone's office and they've been there a long time and they know their time will come when they have to finish, but they don't want that to happen yet. So they're there thinking, right, this youngster, he's after my job. Yeah. Basically. Yeah. You know what I mean? Basically that's what it is. And and you and so I suppose the thing that I was looking to do was to, first of all, because the bit that I, I'd learned already from being sacked at North Ants was it's actually, this is brutal. So mm. I got to learn how to survive. So you get in there and you go, right, how do I survive? How do I align myself with the right people to, to make sure that I'm in and around the decisions that need to be made about my future? Um, and obviously, you then have to go right. These are the people I'm competing with, and even though they're your teammates, you have to outcompete them. Mm. You know what I mean? That's you know that's you want to be picked ahead of them. Yeah. Until until you get in a position where you feel really secure, and you're you're very much a part of the first team, then it's the time, the chance, the chance to really help everyone else grow. Yeah. Now, to start with, it's not right. I'm going to have to be really selfish here. And I'm gonna, I'm gonna make sure that I'm, I'm in this team, in and around this team. Whilst obviously not being, um, outwardly selfish, but inwardly selfish. Yeah. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. You don't, you want to, you don't want to be seen as a selfish person, but you want to be, you want to be selfish in the, in the fact that I'm, I'm going to get this done for me because it's me or him. Hmm. And that's basically how it, how it works in professional sport. And you, but you don't have to be, you don't have to be a dick about it. Yeah. That's that's something that 
I've said to so many kids that are looking to aspire to trying to make it to the next level and, and I experienced it as well. Like it's so true. You go in there and survival mode kicks in. You you got to, because it's so true that when people say like once you've got signed that first contract, then the hard work begins. Like it's, it's cliche, but it's so true because like you said, you think that you're meant to be on a team and you've enjoyed your sport growing up and you've enjoyed it with your mates and it's brilliant. You're all out there having a laugh and then bang, it's job time and it's actually something on the line and someone else's job's on the line if you don't win that that tournament or and it's it has to be an element of yeah you're right you have to be selfish i i sort of looked at it and was like right how can how can i personally be selfish but also it's very hard to feel i guess there'll be some people that will have an internal struggle with that where they'll they'll struggle with thinking well i want to help i want to help john but you're telling me I've got to go and do this for myself, but that is the brutality and that's the reality yeah. of it at the end of the day. Yeah, what you hope is that the, the, the senior players around you are unselfish. Yeah. That's what you hope. You go into an environment where you go, you go and they go, oh, this is a young player, he's obviously a good player. And you hope these guys are unselfish around you and they help you through, which is what happened with me. Um, and, you, and that's why, as I got older and as a more senior player, I always wanted to help the young players. I didn't see them as a threat. I just saw them as an uh, opportunity for me to a grow my coaching, but b so again in a selfish way. Yeah, you know I mean? yeah, yeah. Right. yeah. How yeah. can you help me? Right. <laughs> you are help, helping me. I'm trying to help you. I'm trying to help you, but you're helping me. Yeah. I'm um, long term, but also, also I um, lost the train of thought. But also, I just wanted to. I wanted to help the team. So mm. the event became about the team. It's like the team needs to win. So we need, especially at Gloucestershire, we had a very small squad. Um, we need all the players to play well for each other. So I used to I used to try my best. You know, I, I probably didn't always get it right, and there'll be some young players that say, oh, "I was oh, that John Lewis. He was he was across with me, and I didn't really like him that much. He was he wasn't very nice to me." You know what I mean? But that that I'm sure there'll be players like that. But yeah. the majority, I, I hope, will say that this this bloke helped me as I, as I came into the dressing room. Yeah, you can't please everyone there. You can't because there'll be some people will get it. Some people will understand what it takes and then there'll just be other people that just don't understand it. And that's personalities. Yeah. That's just the the brilliance of being in a in an environment that is just so, so different. Um, what did you, as you started getting getting older and you started going through the years and you've then you start to play, was there a, before you start to play for England, was there, a goal for England from the word go or did it start to accumulate over time? I think it evolved over time. Um, when I first started, it wasn't like I've got to play for England. Mm. I was I was just like, I'm playing for Gloucestershire. Wow. Yeah. You know what I mean? And, um, and then, and then I, I remember having a, I remember very, very vividly having a conversation with Jack Russell who was playing for England at the time and he was sat there and a couple of the lads, you know, there's, there were, a couple of lads were taking the piss out of him because he'd brought his England helmet back and he was wearing it playing for Gloucestershire and you know dressing rooms get a bit you know a couple mm. of the couple of the boys were taking piss out of him about oh you, you play for Gloucestershire now where's your Gloucestershire helmet and Jack was wearing his England helmet and, and I remember I had a little dig at him because everyone else was having to dig at him and he pulled me to one side and he said and he said um you shouldn't you shouldn't take the piss out of that because these guys are only taking the piss out of it because they can't do it so but you you could do it and it's there if you want to do it. And I was like, okay. Wow. And so not only so I was like, okay, I didn't remember. No one ever really told me, talked to me about that. And then following on from that conversation, I, I was traveling with Courtney Walsh and I was I started to talk to him about international cricket, and what it was like playing international cricket. And then I, I just asked him, I said, do you think I could play? And he went, yeah, for sure. <laughs> and I, I'm not sure whether he really believed it. He might have just been being nice. But when he said, yeah, for sure, I was like, okay, well, that's two blokes who play international cricket and think that I can play international cricket. So I'm like, well, I might as well give that give that a go because I'm, I'm I'm all right. I'm playing for Gloucestershire now. I'm really pretty playing pretty consistently for Gloucestershire. I look at all the other players around the country. I see what they do. I'm, I'm, I match up quite well to those guys. Those guys have been talking about playing for England, so why can't I be? Mm. You know what I mean? So then I, that was starting to be the, 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 the forefront of my mind. How do I improve? To play for England. So when I go back to what we started talking about, improvement mindset, growth mindset, the thing that I think was my greatest asset as a, as a cricketer was about my resilience and my ability to look forward and try and improve. I very rarely look back on games. Um, I learned from them quickly, 
So I'd literally learn from them on the night or the day after, and then I'd put that game in the in the bin. I would go right next game. How do I get better for the next game? Hmm. And then how do I get better for the next season? What is it I need to do? How do I improve? Is it, what what is it? And all the time, every every winter or every every game, I'd be looking right. I need to get better all the way through. I'm never about maintenance. It was almost always about improvement. Um, and I think that was my greatest strength as a player. Was right. There's always a way I can improve and get better. Probably right until the end. And even at the end, I was thinking. I remember going to Spain with you guys um, down at Desert Springs there, mm. bowling there. And I just, I just like competing with Mags and and the other the other bowlers there. And and and, I, and it was just about right. I can be better than him. He gets seven mm. wickets a year. My career is going this way. Can I can I then just have one more push? You know what I mean? Yeah, yeah, better. yeah. You know what I mean? You know what I mean? Like, so. I mean, we roomed over there, actually. We were roomed over yeah, there. Yeah, we did, yeah. You had to put up my snoring. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> but did, did you, yeah. when you when you were trying to play for England, like, did you notice something that you needed to get better at? Or were you like, I've just got to continue doing what I'm doing? Or was there something uh, you're like, oh, I've got to break this down. I've got to actually, this is the thing that's yeah. going to get me in the so side. The thing the thing that I I think made the biggest difference was my mentality. Um, so my performances used to yo-yo quite a lot as a young player. Um, so I'd have some really brilliant performances, but then they'd be followed by dips in, in performance. Or and I, I would, through a season, I'd go like that a lot. So I'd be, um, I still get my wickets. I still get, you know, maybe my fifty wickets for the season, or 50, 50 60 wickets for the season. I'm playing my one day cricket, um, but my performance used to go like this. And I didn't always get in the, the Gloucestershire team and the one day team. So I was always pushing to get in that that side and become a mainstay on that side. The one day side was so successful. Um, I was in and out of that side a little bit. Um, so a lot of the skills, um, I remember a game we played at Worcestershire again, really clearly. I think I got three for 20. Um, I came off m- myself and Mike Smith, the left arm swing bowler. He got two for two for 15 and I got three for 20. We bowled him out for like 90 in a B&H game. Uh, and I came off and sat on the balcony, literally. And I thought I was amazing. And the coach at the time, John Bracewell, he started having a go at about how I was bowling. And I thought he was joking. I was like, mate, you're taking the piss, mate. I've just got three for 20. I'm buzzing today, mate. I'm the, I'm the business. You know what I mean? He's like, John, you're bowling the wrong length for one day cricket. I'm like, I'm like what? I'm shut up, mate. Right, and I still, I literally, I remember, I was like, I was literally fobbing him off, like laughing at him, thinking he was taking the, taking the mickey at me. And he was deadly serious. And he said to me, he said to me, if you bowl that length again, um, in, in a game plan for us, I want you to bowl this length. You bowl that length again, you won't play until you until you learn to bowl that length. So net go went out, did exactly the same as I got, did the week before. I think I've got, got I've got two for two for forty or something of ten, and I continued to bowl the length, and I didn't play for a year. Wow, I didn't play for the next year. Right, and I, and I remember, um, and he, he said, "Remember the conversation. That's what I want you to do. So you can't bowl your four day length, the full swingy length, um, playing one day cricket for this team. You're gonna to have to change your length." And until you're able, until you understand that, until you're able to do it, you won't play on this team. I didn't. I literally, I thought I should play. My performance is really good. I didn't play. We played mm-hmm. someone else. We bowled that length. Um, and I was like, and then, so when I got back in the team, funnily enough, I changed the length I bowled. Yeah. <laughs> but to be fair to him, he really praised me for that. Yeah. Out with in front of the team. You know what I mean? So that was really good coaching. Yeah. You know what I mean? So he wanted me to do something. He saw, and looking back at it, it was a real shift in how I bowled in one day cricket, and it really improved my one day bowling. Were you? Um, that must have been a bit of a, a like in, internal torment because you were trying to go, "Well, I'm successful at doing this," yes. and you were trying to tell me to change this, and you've got almost yeah. zero proof on it right now. Well, um, I, I didn't understand. Mm. That's the bit I just didn't understand why he was saying. It. I think if he's explained it a little bit or, or maybe if I I was open so I'll reframe that if I was open to listening to it a bit more carefully yeah I was going to say if he had framed, framed it differently but actually my, with my coaches if that, me as a player was more open to listening to what he was going to say and understanding what he was going to, why he was saying it then I would have shifted quick more quickly um, but again a little bit of stubbornness and the fact that I was being really successful in four day championship cricket and successful in one day cricket, I didn't see why I had to change. Mm. But then when I did change, as soon as I changed, I understood why. 
and, and I understood what his reason was. And then once he'd given you some praise for doing it, he was like, I've been trying to get this, you to do this for so long. And then now you've done it and look at look at the result. You know what I mean? Right? And it was like, right, penny drops, golf, I understand. Yeah. Now it's, you know, it's, it's, it's how, I, how I understand playing one-day cricket now. So it's just um, being a whole, little bit open. Yeah, just being open as a player, which is at times, especially especially when you're being successful, and I was being yeah. pretty successful. I think I was pushing to. I think I was. I might have even been selected, or been on the verge of selecting for 18 tours and stuff like that. I was like, I don't need to change. What's he talking about? Mm. Uh, but then I got it. Eventually, I got it, and and it improved me a lot as a bowler. And you think that was one thing that helped you get into to the England yeah. team? Yeah. Yeah, definitely. So that change of that change of style, and change of length, just um, being control open to my that. length. Yeah, you know, we'll just control my length a lot better. It wasn't a lot. I was only able to move my length back maybe two yards or a yard and a half. Yeah. So I was hitting the splice of the bat rather than the middle of the bat or the middle edge of it. So I was always trying to get uh, edge, uh, a nick off a drive Yeah. rather than a nick off a splice splice length. Yeah. Um, he said, well, you just got to hit splice length more often because if you if the ball doesn't move, someone will get on top of you and the ball they will ping you and you'll, you'll eat more runs. And So that combine that with the ability to change my pace a bit more um, and bowl that change of pace a bit more than you know. I think that my numbers went, my runs per over went down a lot. I yeah. might not taken that many more wickets, but I was going. I'm probably going at. This is how the games changed. I was probably going at four and a half and over. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. yeah. And 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 then I was going down to three and a half. Yeah. Wow. You know what I mean? So you go down from going from forty-five to thirty-five. That's how the games changed. So if you're around you're like five or six there. now, is that, is well, that... if you go if you're going under six, so we used to go. Uh, a really good day was under 30. An okay day was under 40. If you went over 40, you're getting smacked. Yeah. In 10 overs. You know <laughs> That's what I mean? a you're good day out now. What are you doing, mate? No, under, four, under, under 50 now is like you were one of the most amazing bowler in the world. Yeah. But no, even I was... if I have a look at my international numbers, I think I think I was going under five and over Yeah. in international cricket, uh, international one-day cricket, which... You know, is re- re- reality now. That's ridiculous. That's how much yeah. the game shifts, and yeah. I think that's one really important thing to understand as a coach is that the game isn't the same as the game you played, and you've got to shift with oh, it. Yeah, and and the game is a lot easier when, than when you're watching than when you're playing. Yeah, remember how hard a game it is. Yeah. because you, it's, there's so many times I hear coaches going, "Oh, why isn't he just doing that? Oh, why isn't he just doing that? I've done it myself." You know what I mean? I've done it myself. And I'm like, what's he doing? He should just do this. And I mean, rock, can he not just do that? And I hear my catch myself doing it, and I'm like, no, you've got to be able to, um, you've got, you've got to be able to, um, what, what do I call it? You've got to be able to understand that the, the game is um, a lot harder when you play it than when you're watching it. Yeah, yeah. I um, that actually is such <laughs> such a good point. I I've caught myself trying to do well saying things like that and going, hold on, I'm still playing. Like, I understand actually what, what you're going. There's a million and one things going on in your mind. And, and more than often, not, actually not necessarily a million and one things, you're actually just zoned in on one thing. And you're just like, I can't let go of this this thing right now. And I've, I've got to, um, I, I can't think spatially or whatever it is that's that's going on. And that's the that's actually a skill you have to try and learn, I guess, at some point. Um, you mentioned something when we were when you mentioned when we we roomed together and i remember this so vividly there was a day and i'd i'd really be interested to see if you still speak about this way of thinking or if you still think think about it remember you you were actually transitioning into i think coaching on that trip you were you were still playing but you were definitely taking on a coaching role at that at that stage and the way you were mentoring us and you sat us down as bowlers and I think you asked us at the time, like, how many first class wickets have I got? And everyone's like peeling off your numbers, like it's, it's eight hundred and forty nine, isn't it? It's I've, I've, had, I've actually looked that up because I'm like, I've got to do the maths on this. Now I I'm can't. Thinking, remember... I'm thinking, what did I say? Well, yeah, I yeah, no, 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 no. So you, you, you said it was eight hundred and forty nine wickets that you took, and you asked us, you went, how many fifers do you reckon I've got? And you class a fifer as your day, really. If you get a fifer. Five wickets in innings, like that's your, that's a good day, essentially. It's, that's been John's day. And we're like reeling off, like it's got to be 100, John. It's got to be 80, eight, somewhere around 80. And it's 35. 
And then you would say, well, out of all the wickets I took, 35 fifers, that meant 4% or just over 4% of my game wickets I took were like my day was my day. So it's all about what do you do on the other days? How do you just continuously rather and you were talking about those peaks and troughs that you had those ups and downs and you'd have like days where you did really well and you drop off and that for me was a massive penny drop for the way I went about my game because I was like well you can have the intention to walk out onto the field every day and and take a five for score a hundred get a hat trick in a game of football get five tries in a rugby match whatever it is you can have that intention to be that but it doesn't necessarily it's not always your day so when you reckon how quickly can you recognize your role changes within the day and you actually may play a supporting role you may all you have to do is just get one or two and just tick over to get to the next game the next game because essentially the stats say that the next few more days or games one's going to come if you just keep going so yeah, I just I, I, that th- that whole story that day resonated with me so strongly, and something that I've I've passed on to others because the idea I think where it helps people is when they fail and when they don't have that success and they don't have the day where they're the one getting the accolades, they're the ones on the paper or just being patted on the back. Um, so yeah, I I don't know if you still think like that yeah, if you if you interesting yeah so i was i was at a point um i'm glad it wasn't just about me and all my wickets and my pipers so <laughs> yeah. like, gather around boys i've got a story to tell <laughs> real off a story about me about me telling everyone how good i was yeah. <laughs> so, um but like yeah um i suppose it's ma- what i was trying to explain i suppose during in my head is like about managing the ex- your own expectations yeah and and understanding that you turn up to the ground and of course you turn up to the ground and you want to take 10 wickets. You want to take every wicket. Mm. But if your expectations are like are that high, you're always going to walk away from the game disappointed. Mm. And geez, that's going to be a tough life as a professional player playing day in, day out. Every yeah. day you're going to walk away disappointed rather than looking at every day as, a, as a, oh, I've done, I've done my job today. What is my job today? What does the team require from me now today to do? And, you know, when it's your job with the, with the new ball, you, each spell is about, if you can take one wicket in each spell or or, or restrict runs in each spell, I mean, the teams, you've done a good job for the team. Mm. And so you might bowl a five over spell. And if you're, if your only aim is to take one wicket in that spell and restrict the runs as much as, much as you possibly can and control the batsman, you're doing, you're doing a great job for the team. You know what I mean? So, and if, but if your expectation is to come and take every time you grab hold of the ball, it's like, I should be getting this guy out every ball. You're going to walk away from almost every ball disappointed. Mm. So, the, 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 the statistics of the game that we play are that if you control an area on the pitch with the ball, if you're accurate enough to be able to bowl at an area on the pitch and move that ball, the statistics of the game tell you that you will be successful mm. over time. You might not be successful that day because the batsman might have his day and he might he might nick a few two drop catches, one inside edge past the keeper. You know what I mean? Mm, That's, yeah. You might bowl those same balls the next day, and you might get three wickets yeah. with those same balls. You know what I mean? So the game tells you from as long as that game's been the game's being played, the control in your length and the control in your line with some movement at that decent pace, you will always get wickets. Mm. So, yeah. so that's the game. Because all the best bowlers have done it. They've just done it more often and probably a little bit quicker. Yeah. So I was going to say about what, when now you've stepped into the England team and you've got, well, you've got Broad and Anderson, you've got England's two best bowlers. And what have you found? Do they have expectations of, of what they do? What, what do you believe has allowed them to be so successful for so long compared to the everyday, well, I say everyday, the every other professional that's kind of played yeah. the game. I suppose the first thing to say, everyone always lumps Broad and Anderson together. Yeah, yeah, I think they're I know very, you they're might very different, very different people, and they're very different bowlers. I mean, and, and I think, and, and there's always partnership. Everyone talks about you know, McGrath and Warren, yeah, Greenwich and Haynes, you know, Ambrose and Walsh, Eunice and Wackar and Wazim, you know, and. Their uniqueness 
is what makes them a great partnership. So mm. the, the way they are, the, if they were both the same, they wouldn't be a great partnership. Yeah. Um, their, their differences is what make them a great partnership, I, I think. Um, but what they both are is great competitors. Mm. So you, you, if I'm watching young bowlers, I'm, I'm, I'm looking for athletic ability, competitiveness, fun, enjoyment, you know, those sorts of things before I look at their technique. I mean, so I'm looking at guys who are like, okay, can they move? Are they natural? Are they competitive? Are they competing? And then do they understand how to get people out? Mm. You know what I mean? And I think those are the things that those two guys have got. They understand how to get people out. And, and geez, they're competitive. Like, Jimmy Anderson is an absolute perfectionist. Um, and he competes and competes and competes. He competes in practice. He competes with himself. He competes with the batter. If you, you can, you compete in anything, you know what I mean? Yeah. And Stuart was the same, but in a different way. You no, know, Stuart is much more, he wants to compete on the field. He's not so he's that much interested in competing in practice. Or if he does, if you do go to practice, you've got to make sure there's some competition there for him. So it stimulates him. Whereas Jimmy, Jimmy's, Jimmy's very different and they're very, very different people. And then obviously you have to coach them differently hmm. because they're different people. Um, and it's, I suppose that, but also with the, the guys who have played that much to that level, you've got to keep challenging them, but within reason. You know what yeah. I mean? And at the right, and I think the most important thing is at the right time, hmm. um, because they're well within their rights to say, "Coach, do one." I'm yeah. not interested. I'm not interested in what you got to say right now. I know what I'm doing. I'm just going to get on with my business. But at the right time. Again, like I say, when when you feel that there's an opening to, to have a conversation about how to how to improve their skills because they want to improve, that's again something that stands out about both of them is they they still want to improve. There's still ambition there. As soon as that ambition stops, I think they'll both know that's that's the time for them to stop. But right now, geez, they're they're both competing as hard as ever. They both want to be as best they can. They both want to improve all the time. And there's always something they're trying to do. So that those are the things you always look out for in great players. Yeah. It might also must be quite nice. You get to work with Joffre as well quite a bit, considering your history with him. And, and for people that don't know, you actually housed him for, I, I mean. You know, <laughs> he, he, went, he went in the room. He was he read, his landlord. Yeah. <laughs> how how <laughs> long did you have him? You had him for quite a while. Um, a year and a half, two years maybe. Yeah. yeah. So, um, I mean, his, his nice journey has been mad from when I think when he first yeah. turned up yeah it's, I first met Joffre in the clubhouse and I think everyone who's been to Sussex has stayed in the You're clubhouse the club, oh, yeah. yeah you have yeah down by the club, <laughs> arms there at home. and he, was, he came down he was cooking some uh, cooking some some sort of chicken or fish or something I know he's cooking chicken or fish or something but it was like literally Finbus out of a packet and <laughs> I think he I think he burnt it and I was like, mate, have you got any idea? You had to, had to cook this, and he was looking at me like, didn't say much. And I'm like, and, um, and and then eventually he came back over time, and, and you know, I actually suggested to the to the club, and it was there was a benefit to both me and to him. Obviously, it helped pay for for me to be able to to work down in Sussex, mm. um, to have guys living with us. But obviously, for him and and, and Delroy Rawlins. The guys who are from from the Caribbean, away from their families, to be in and around a family, mm. I think, and, and, sh- and to have the support of people around them at home, um, I think is really important because you can get lonely away from home. You know what I mean? And um, I hope I hope that he feels that we helped him settle in Sussex and helped him feel comfortable and able to fit into the the environment there. Um, the thing that you know about both those lads is that I know about both those lads from living with them. Is they're both good people, mm. um, so so to reconnect with someone who's obviously a fantastic cricketer, um, but also a good a good person as well, is um is good fun for me. You know what I mean, it's 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 um it's nice to be involved in anyone's journey, but to have people in in your home and to support them in more ways than just than just around the cricket ground. I suppose creates a much more trusted relationship, um, and to have—I wouldn't say that I have over the recent times I've really helped Joffre improve, 
but I know that when he needs me to help him improve, he'll feel comfortable coming to talk to me about it, mm. which he may not do. He may, you know, we talked earlier about vulnerability and Joffrey in particular isn't a great one for expressing any vulnerability. Mm. Um, however, if there's a time that he does feel vulnerable and he needs help, he knows that he can trust me to, to help him. Mm. I think, you know, I hope. Yeah. You know what I mean? Like, yeah. um, and I suppose that's the nice thing about that relationship in particular is that I've always, like, I try and I try and make all the players that I coach feel like that. Mm. Uh, that they, they can trust me and they, that I'm trying all, all, all the time. My intention is to help them as, as players and, and as people. Um, so I think that's important as well. Um, so I hope that all the players that I've, I've come across and coached feel that way. But that may necessarily be true. But what I'm hoping more with Joffrey is obviously that's gone a little bit further than that because he's, he was in a, in a home around our family. Yeah, and that, and that trip, I mean, I've had that, exp- I've essentially been on Joffre's end of that stick being in Australia. And you did it when you went to New Zealand. Like when you're 18 years old, you're miles away. I, I remember that first night of being travelled that 10,000 mile trip and you're literally, I was housed by a, another family and they, they were, they were, the sur- my surrogate family out here in Adelaide now and they I remember just lying in their spare bedroom like that first night just like shit and that was <laughs> I'm ten- I am miles away from anything I- I- I've got nothing and that was where you grow up like you actually learn the ways like you, you might learn cooking you might learn how to yeah. actually get somewhere on time you might learn anything but I, I always encourage that whole getting out there travel uh, travel at a young age and, and try and throw yourself into that deep end and it's lovely if you have got someone there that can support you and just point you in the right direction every now and then it's nice that you were able to do that yeah well i suppose i mean i'm just reflecting on what you said there which is that if you don't try you'll never know mm. so there's young people out there who are worried or anxious about about thinking oh could i do that i'm not sure i could do that well if you don't try you don't go and have a go You'll never know. And, and like I keep saying, like I've said to all the young players, I've put, like, you get it wrong, it's okay. No one no one gets it right. There's no one person who's got every decision in their life right. Mm. It's like parenting. Parenting's bloody hard. Mm. Um, and no one, no one gets it right all the time. And people who think they do, they're, they're kidding themselves. Yeah. The, that actually, re- that now reminds me of something that uh, I wanted to to talk about, which was, you again you were the person obviously with what i'm doing now working with yoga and mindfulness and meditation for athletes and you were the first person who actually pushed me in the direction of going to try yoga and i remember the reason why you said to do it and it was kind of aligned with when we had a psychologist around the team at the same time i think and you said well why wouldn't you why would you not leave a stone unturned why would you leave a stone unturned why would you not try these things are there to help you um And I just always remember you having that mentality of being able to go and try something. And if it didn't work, that's fine. But at least you tried. At least you you gave something a go. And even if it is something different, if it is something that is is unique. And, And I've even picked up on it in the way you've been talking about your coaching. Like just trying something, going and learning something new. You never know when you may actually need it later on in life. You might not need it right now but it could be something that you later on need. Um, I think that's something that you've definitely, one, taught me, but I think is is so valuable for people to understand that if you're going to try some, get somewhere with what you do, don't leave a stone unturned. Try everything that you possibly can to get yourself in that, that best place. Yeah, I'm, I remember that conversation we had. Um, the reason I remember the conversation is because of obviously what you've gone on to do. Mm. You know what I mean? Like, um, like, and what I really love about what you're doing is, um, is again, you, you're going out there and you're pushing yourself out there, and, you, and you're going right. I've got to, I've got to work out a way. I can't play cricket anymore. Um, I've had an injury. I can't play anymore um, to the standard that I want. I really wanted to play, mm. um, but I'm going to go and try and do something else. And I, I really, I love that uh, in, in you. I love the way you've you've branched out and you've gone right. I, I, I'm going to try and I'm going to go and try and try and do something. And you, and you did it. And you thought I really like this, and then you carried on, and you've made it into something that you that you you love doing. And you're clearly really passionate about it because you continue to go and do it. But I tell you the reason why I suggested it for you 
because I thought I was watching you um, train and I was watching you um, practice and I was watching you prep for games and I was like, Jesus guy, he is intense. Yeah. He is just like, so I'm like, this guy just needs to calm down and breathe a little bit. Yeah. And I'm like, I was watching you do it and, and you were trying so hard. And I was like, this, like you, you couldn't have tried any harder to be the best professional cricketer you, you could possibly be. And I was like, how could this guy, how can I get this guy just to relax a little bit and to mm. breathe and to think and give himself some space to just calm down a fraction. So hopefully when he goes on the field, he's able to breathe and he's able to breathe and just to play. And so I thought, uh, I tell you, I, because I did a bit of yoga towards the end of my career and I found it really, really useful. I still do a little bit now, not as much as I probably should coach. Um, but, um, <laughs> but, um, but I do. And I do find it to give yourself that, that peace and that space, just a bit of time for you. And mm. that you're only, the only thing you're doing is for you. You're not thinking about anyone else or what anyone else is doing. Um, that time for you is invaluable. And so just to give yourself to prioritize, whether it's daily or every second day, some time, some space to be able to just breathe. Mm. And everyone will have their own way of doing it. Uh, at the moment, I'm, I'm into getting out on the bike and I'm, and I'm doing quite a lot of that. And, and so every couple of days I go out for a couple of hours and, and I, I really enjoy the feel, the exercise feeling, but also I enjoy the fact that I can only really think about riding the bike. Mm. Um, so I love going on holiday. I love skiing on holiday because you can only really feel, think about where's my next turn mm. or who's in front of me that I'm not trying to crash into or, or stop fall over. You know what I mean? Yeah. You can't think about all the other stuff that goes on all day in your brain. And I think that's the, that was my intention when I suggested it to you was to try and give you space to to just just calm a fraction because yeah. I, was, I was seeing a young man so desperate to to succeed that yeah. sometimes you just got to give yourself a chance to stop and reflect and think and go okay I'm all right at this I just need to just be a little bit better not it's yeah. not that far away. And, and and really, it worked. Like for me, it did work. It gave me that space. I saw an upward curve, and then unfortunately, injury happens. And that, but that was on an upward curve at the time. So I know it had an impact. And I know almost within my my mind, I was much more at ease with things, and I was much more comfortable in sort of my own skin. And and I think initially, I was yeah, I was trying so hard to just do well. And I was in again that survival mode. I think I was just like, where can I grasp the next rung on the ladder, and I will, f- I'll fight to get it somehow. But it, it did give me that space, and it's something that I, I think is super valuable for young people to be able to do that now. Because I think, geez, social media wasn't even what it was like now. There's there's a million and one distractions compared to that that are amplifying the smallest, the smallest problem, and it's making it harder. Do do you see that sort of thing with even the guys at the next? level up the the, uh, the top level the top level guys um are more in control of right that okay sort of stuff. they're like they they're very clever about how they use social media some of them not all of them yeah the guys that i worry about more are the young players coming through now um, right what observations around our best young players is there seems to be a a thirst or a need for recognition mm. rather than a thirst and a hunger for learning and performance, which then will bring that recognition. It's almost like the recognition is in, is more important than the performance mm. or the, how the team plays. You know what I mean? So that own, their own personal stuff gets ahead of gets ahead of, um, of how the team, how important it is to do the job for the team. So that's my concern with how people use or how influenced they are by social media now how everything is sort of false there's a false and there's, everything's either false or it's one perspective right at the one side or the complete pendulum at the other side where reality yeah. is most people live pretty much in the center yeah with their with their opinions pretty much in the center they're either center right or center left we're getting a little bit political here most people just live around there. The majority they live around there, but all the opinions are either this side or that side, and that's the same with someone's cricket. You never get a message on Twitter or Instagram saying, 
oh, well done. That was a pretty um, solid but average sort of day today, mate. Yeah, um, yeah. yeah you, you got you got a couple of wickets. I thought the, the two wickets you got were really nice, but then there was a couple of balls you didn't bowl very well. It's either you were brilliant or you were crap. Yeah, there's nothing. Yeah. Nothing sits in the middle. There's no yeah. like well done, good day on a day where it's just mediocre. And it's similar. It was similar with. Um, so Graham thought they made a great piece of advice when I when I first joined the England cricket setup. He said, "Don't read the press," because right. he said you might well take you make you make you'll get seven for fifty, and you'll have your best ever day, and you'll read through every bit every paper, and there'll be one comment from one person somewhere that says that you weren't that great. It was like so don't bother. There's no point, yeah. and it was easy then because it was just a paper. Yeah. Chuck but then the hardest, bit was, the hardest bit was that the, your family would read the paper and they would talk to you about it. So they're the people that it affects. But now, because everything is so accessible and it's there in front of you and it's addictive, um, you, you you just read it and you read it and you read it and it, it can affect you. So I, 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 it really concerns me about, especially our young players, this generation growing up with social media rather than the, the guys who are a bit older, so you're 27, 28 to 30 year olds, I think they they can manage it better. The guys below, below that 25 and under who are growing up with it, you know, I think it's the it's a, it's an issue that they have to understand how to deal with. It. How do you how do you foresee them having to deal with it, or, or what? How do you think the best way for them to deal with it and and sit in that that space because the the whole thing is designed to give you that recognition. And yeah. it's designed to draw you in. Mm-hmm. Um, I'm, I'm a big believer in. Well, I'm a big believer in, and I, I understand how I use my social media. So I use it. So I, I basically break it up and like, am I watching this for education, uh, entertainment, uh, and really, I guess, in, in information. So le- like learning something as well. Again, so kind of linked with education anyway. Um, and I think it's trying to invoke an emotion and understanding why you're why you're engaging with that emotion like how does it make you feel about yourself uh, so is that bit of social media that you're you're viewing is it designed to make you better or is it really making you feel worse because you can also the algorithms are built to, to show you more of what you like so if if you like learning about physics it will show you all the physics you want if, if you if you're looking for the best people who are having their best day holidays or whatever then that's it's going to show you that as well and you're going to feel crap because you're not well, on that I, day. I think the way you've explained it there is a really good way of, of um, explaining it to young people mm. like as soon as you move from education or gaining knowledge to to looking at yourself yeah. you know, it's not me or self gratification or 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 whatever it is or self recognition whatever it is you, you're looking for and I, I, I think um that's but you've obviously got a, a handle on that and I, I do exactly the same I use it but I don't use it for me I use it to learn and I use it to read and I use it to gather information um, so I think the way you've explained that is, is fantastic and it's probably a really good way to, to try and get young people to use it and the problem being is that they've been on it for such a long time by the time you get, you get in contact with them yeah, you, it's a habit. It's ingrained. Yeah, it's an ingrained yeah. habit, and it's it's you know my phone sat here in front of me. This thing's pinging at me, I, and I look at it. You know what I mean? Like yeah. rather than like, just turn it over, turn it, put it to the side because I'm having a conversation with you. Yeah, so it's, it's just it's a distraction. Yeah. Um. Yeah, so, so you've got to understand how you, how you use it and how it affects you. But that generally we talked we already talked about teenagers not being able to control emotion that sort of stuff. Um, we've all talked about um, not being able to make great decisions. We've talked about that sort of stuff, and it it doesn't surprise me that they're the ones probably most affected. Yeah, I think that's where actual like my mindfulness practice really helped me, really helped me because just all it's giving you is the understanding of where's my mind at right now, and it's not telling me to do anything else. It's just where is my mind engaged right now? I can be on my phone and I can be mindless, and but I actually can I recognize that i'm on that oh, okay i've caught myself because you you can very easily not catch yourself you can very mm. easily not catch yourself and then you and then the next hour's gone and that's it 
but mindfulness the practice of just doing it practice of being mindful just allows you to throw in that break just put that put a little bit of spanner in the in the spokes real quick and then stop everything going and that wheel turning too fast and then you can catch it and it doesn't mean you're gonna it's not gonna turn again it doesn't mean that you're not gonna you're gonna get back on it it just means that next time it happens you become aware of it okay i'm not doing what i want to do and then you add those time the time spent where you've caught yourself up you've intentionally you've you've become more focused you've become more focused at what you're doing and you're you're engaged in what you're doing for sure yeah i I think the the confidence thing is is the 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 tough one for for the kids as well like it's it's just going to rip their confidence away and and that that's what i see i think and self-belief i think sometimes they believe they can't get there they 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 see someone that's got there and and i even had someone just message me today like how can i build my self-belief up and i get the the exercise that i've given people for building their self-belief up or their building their self-confidence is one to to think of like when they were confident visualize when you were last confident when you did something it could be as simple as you opened up a jar and you felt confident opening up a jar whatever it is and but you've that you've embodied that feeling of of confidence then the next thing is actually where you want to be so it could be you in two months it could be you in two years 10 years and then what does that person look like and how do they look act and sound and then from that are you acting like that person do you have an understanding of but even if you don't know you've now highlighted what you want to look like and you can compare it to where you are now and you yeah. can see right these are the things that i'm I've, I've clearly gone away from so when i was confident and where i want to be and, I, and at least you've just brought your attention to the fact that okay these are areas i want to work on yeah for me confidence comes from competence yeah so yeah you, you know if, if you're competent at something you you, you grow in confidence confident you can't if you're not very good at something, it's very hard to be confident at it. Hmm. But then you've got to understand. And then so the reality is, is this is reality. This is where I'm at now. This is what like you talked about there. This is what I want to get to. And what does progression look like? Hmm. So if you take your jar opening um, analogy, it's like, well, progression looks like I can turn it a bit further. I've gone and worked on my grip. <laughs> I can turn it a little bit further, but I still haven't opened it yet. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? So, and then, oh, okay, I'll go away, make my grip stronger. Oh, I can turn it a bit further. You know what I mean? Like that's, yep. And then all of a sudden, oh, I've made my grip really strong. I can open the jar. Yeah. You know what I mean, so, so, but you've got to understand and, and be, and understand where, what reality is and where you're trying to get to, and then understand what progression looks like. And understand, understand that progression can go backwards and forwards. Mm-hmm. It can be regression, but you have to learn from that regression to progress some more. I mean, and then all of a sudden you become you become confident. Yeah. Something, because you can do it. Yeah. Um, you get, if you, you do something, it's very hard to be confident in that. Habit. And you build that and motivation. And um, that that's um, you see people who can't do things, who will outwardly look confident, but as soon as you put them under pressure, they fall. Have you come so across pl- the, people like that? In, at, loads, loads of yeah. people. That's, that's the that's your your bully type bravado walk tall type person big puff the chest out type person and then all of a sudden you put them under pressure and they, they go quieter and quieter and quieter the body language gets smaller and smaller and smaller and all of a sudden they fall you know what i mean so what about people that have of- made it to the top and you feel like that because that i've seen people that have got to the top sometimes and they probably haven't been challenged on their way up there yet and then they've got to the top, they've got to, let's say, first-class cricket in our instance, and they get to first-class cricket and then, bang, finds them out. It just catches them. There you are. But the, the, the understanding, so I suppose the understanding you have is that isn't the top. Yeah. So they, th- they think that's the top, but reality is the top is being the best in the world across all conditions, hmm. home and away. So that's the top. You know what yeah. I mean? So... If someone thinks that the top is getting into first class cricket, they're miles away from the top. Yeah. So, so you know I mean? so like, so if they're, if they're but they're like, oh, this is my this is my Everest, I've got it. Then of course they're going to fail because they won't try and keep improving. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. yeah that's um. Yeah, it's true, mate. We've gone. We've gone uh, over an hour. This is awesome. Time. Yeah, we've gone. It's been an amazing conversation. Um, I know. I actually. One thing I'd, I've got that I had that CBD 
sent over to me re- recently and okay yeah. you you you, advise, you pushed me onto the cbd uh yeah I felt all right oh, yeah, on it. Yeah. I felt all right on it. Yeah. yeah, it's not. It's not been too bad. I've. I mean, I've only been doing it. I'd say, maybe a week. Yeah. Um, that little, a uh, little tablet before, before the day, and then, and then a the little drop it before not bed. It's. If, I mean, my sleep's feeling good. Sleep is feeling good. That's for sure. I. I, I want to get. I want to get back in a gym. That's for the, the one thing I want to do. I want to get back in and lifting, some sort of weights and having that, that real. Um, like Dom's feeling and see how it goes there. And I've pulled away from a bit of running recently. I went a bit mad on running and I, I, um, and I thought, mate, Oh, I just was, I'm going to play cricket and I'll I'll get through the season, but I want to test it. I want to see how it goes under a bit more strain. How have you felt with it? Yeah. Yeah. So recovery in particular, I've, I've I've found it's great. I can really, it's helped me sleep. Um, but what I would say is I'd give it, Give it a month. Yeah. Okay. Right. So, so it takes it takes quite a while to get into the system. Um, if you take it regularly for a month, I've um I've I've been taking it now for six eight months, maybe maybe a bit longer now, eight, nine months, and my recovery from exercise, I just don't get the doms. Yeah. Right. But I'll go out, I'll go out and I'll ride hard, like on the bike for two hours. I'll probably do two hours of about sixty k on the bike. Right, so I'm riding pretty hard for someone of my level. You know what I mean? I'm an amateur cyclist. Um, but um, I ride pretty hard and, and as, as hard as I can. I'll get off the bike and my, my legs will be like, um, sometimes I'm like, oh, that was hard. I'll, I'll, I've been working really, really hard. Um, and I'll, I'll expect to get up the next day feeling stiff and sore. And I don't. Yeah. And I'm like, That's, I could go again the next day. I, don't, I generally don't. I generally go two days, two days a day in between to space it out a little bit. Um, but I, if I wanted to, I feel like I could get up and go again as hard the next day. Yeah. And I, it was during furlough time that I was, I started running. And I just couldn't run. It was just too sore. Um, so um, I started taking the CBD stuff, um, and it's worked really, really well for me. I'm Pure excited is, to see. Pure, I'm, yeah, pure. CBD. Pure is CBD. That is the one we've been using. Um, it's it's good. It's 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 a nice brand. Um, it's, it seems like it's it's got it all sorted out. And, and I'm really excited if it does go into sport. I think yeah, that's the thing that's, that's really good about that brand in particular is it's 100 synthetic. So there isn't any of the um, uh, what they call THC, so which is the hallucinogenic part right. of cannabis. So there's none of that in it. So they've taken because th- it's 100 100 synthetic. I was going to say. Yeah, there's none of it in there. So, it's, I was, so it's. Cool. I, th- I, th- I think that's what people get hung up on, don't they? I think that's the yeah. thing. I was just going to say, like, that's the thing that people get hung up on with CBD. They think is, is cannabis. Like, yeah. so it's good to know that that is. Yeah. That's that, the thing well, about that, this one. Part, that product in particular has no THC in it. Um, yeah. And you know, and it's it's the only product on the market at the moment that has government approval it's gone through all the testing it's the only product so mm. you know for me um it feels like a really safe product to take yeah you know what I mean? uh, yeah the, that was the that's the attraction i think yeah, that comes to the sportsman in in us making sure that what yeah. we're taking is the right thing and it, yeah. like i said i think it's going to be real interesting if it gets into sport yeah. that would be lovely to see it get into sport and see so it, it sounds like some of the golfers in america have started taking Right. I saw that okay. Paul Mickelson had been taking some recently, yeah. promoting it. So, it's different sports have different um, uh, codes, um, drug codes, don't they? So yeah. yeah. It's the fact that there's no CB, no THC in it, means that it's safe to take for sportsmen, mm. but it's not on the approved list yet. I think the, the company are working really hard to get it on the approved list. So, um, that, that, over time, we'll see what happens. Be great if they can. Be great if they can and see it go. Mate, look, I'm going to let you go. You've um, you've given me more than enough of your time today. That's been amazing. It's been awesome chatting. I've I've loved this. Um, cool. I think Good some of the stuff. You, yeah, you too. I um, I hopefully I'll, I'll see you when I'm back in the UK. I'm back in the UK pretty soon. So, uh, yeah, hopefully I can catch up with you. If people want to reach out to you, you're obviously on you're on Twitter. So you're yeah. at John Lou eight hundred. That's it. Yeah. Easy. So people can find you there. Um. Mate, have a great rest of the day. 
and thank you so much for coming on. Pleasure, Hatch.